So I go ahead and tell people this. Give your life to Jesus. You'll never regret it. Life on this earth, yeah, it's going to be hard. For Jesus said, in this world, you'll have tribulation. But Paul said, the trials that we go through right here works a far more weight of glory in, in heaven. Therefore, get your mind off of today, tomorrow, and next week, and focus your eyes upon eternity. For when you leave this earth, you will not regret the fact that you said one day, Jesus, come into my life and help me every day to live a life that's pleasing in your sight. Do we always keep that before the Lord? Do we always say, well, I'm going to live a life that's pleasing to the Lord? No. Somehow or another, we mess up. If not in action, in mind. And that's why we need Jesus every day. Not every day. I, 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 was, <clears throat> I was doing, I was speaking to a family who had uh, lost their loved one. And uh, uh, let me see, it was 44 years earlier that he gave his life to the Lord. But since then, when he got up from the altar, he lived the life the way he wanted to. And at his funeral, the statement was made, once saved, always saved. Well, once saved, always saved, if you're living for the Lord every day, Right on. You're secure. But once saved and then get up and do anything and everything you want to? No, that's not the way the, that's not the, way the gospel is. So therefore, yes, as Paula was singing that song, you are going to have problems, but you'll never face them alone. God is with you always, and I thank God for that. I was thinking last, this past week as, as I was ministering something on YouTube, uh, I thought, uh, problems and troubles and trials and situations that people go through. And I have to say, I've gone through a couple, but they don't seem that bad. And yet other people would look on and say, looks pretty bad to me. But when you've got the grace of God to sustain you, you can make it. Just like I say to Shania and to Charity and Vicki and Pauletta. When you got God, His grace will sustain you. And though the fire will rage around you, it will not burn you. Though the floods come against you, He will raise up a standard against it. Hallelujah. They're not going to overflow you. Hallelujah for the love and the powerful grace of God. Are we standing strong in that faith, though? Do we stand strong in the faith of the Lord? And I'm not talking about the mountain-moving kind of faith to say, I stand in this mountain, be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea. That, that is one kind of faith. That's the God kind of faith, for sure. But there's another kind of faith that simply is the kind of faith of sustaining, a sustaining faith. I am locked into the Lord. I am locked into him. I'm a prisoner of the Lord, so to speak. Now, Romans 4, verse 20, says, Abraham never wavered in believing God's promise. In fact, his faith grew stronger in this that he brought forth glory to the Lord. Abraham's faith never wavered in believing in God's promise. I want to have faith like that. I do. I want to have faith like that. But, but faith is not just a confession. Uh, uh, faith is work. Faith is something you work on. And if you work it, you work it through the test that God gives you. It's just like, uh, it's just like weight loss. Uh, if I'm heavy overweight, you know, and I got about 500 pounds on me and I want to lose a couple pounds of it. <laughs> I just can't say, well, I'm believing I'm skinny. I can talk it all day long I want to and be eating the whole time I'm saying it. But I'm not going to lose anything. And or, I'd like to be a Charles Atlas. Mm, muscles of steel. 
Oh, I'm not going to get it by saying, all right, muscles grow. Come on. Wake up. <laughs> it's not going to happen. And God knows it too. And that's why he puts us through test. He did Abraham. Abraham's a good old guy. Did what God said do. But God tested him over and over again. Why? Because every time Abraham's test uh, of faith was in existence, his faith grew. Every time you pick up a, a, a barbell and, and you, you press it and you press it and you press it, why, you know, that 25 pounds that you're lifting right now can turn into 30 pounds next week and it keeps growing. And by the time you get to 150, that 150 is going to feel like that 30 pounds felt like months ago because you're growing. In the same way it is with, with the, the weight loss. You continue to do what is right to do to get weight loss, and all of a sudden it begins to come off. Not as fast as you'd like, but it comes off, so eventually. So it is with our faith. We want our faith to grow, but we don't want to go through anything to go to get it to grow. We don't want to go through the school of faith. I've told this before, and, and I'm sure you've probably heard it too. I had a teacher tell me when I was in the fourth grade, I, man, I, I was already having a difficult time. And she said to us, she said, class, I wish I could just drill a hole in your head. And all of a sudden I was thinking, yeah. Drill a hole in my head and pour in all the knowledge I need, and I'm going to be all right. Have you all ever heard that? It never happened. As much faith as I had for it to happen, it never did. I had to go through class after class, test after test, and you did too if you graduated college or high school. You know you had to work at it, and so it is with our faith. We work at it. Paul warns us this way in 1 Timothy 4. He says, Now the Holy Spirit tells us clearly that the last time, or the last days, some will turn away from the faith. Now here's where your faith has got to be strong. And you've got to work at it every day. Because in the last days, and, and folks, we're living in the last days. I was thinking about that this morning. I said, but yeah, well, back in Paul, when Paul was talking to Timothy and saying in the last days, was it the last days then? Yes, it was. Because, you see, a day with the Lord is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as a day. So we're living in the last days. And with everything that's going on around us, folks, it just really says to me, we're living there. We're living there. And, of course, this is not an not a, uh, exhortation on the coming of the Lord. But when Paul says, in the last days, perilous times are come, and men will depart from the faith, Follow deceptive spirits and teachings of demons. These pip people are hypocrites and their conscience are dead. You wonder why you hear on the news of some of the most devious and horrendous crimes committed against the human being? And you say, how could anybody do that? How can anybody just, just kill somebody and dismember them and scatter their parts asunder? How? Because their conscience is seared. They don't feel anything at all. They don't care. And you see, if we don't continue to operate and, and tend to our faith, how do we tend to our faith? I think it's through prayer, through the reading of the Word, and the gathering of ourselves together. That feeds the Spirit so that our faith is stronger and stronger, so that we are not deceived when the enemy comes along and says something like, Satan is God. Have you ever heard that? Satan is God. He is a supreme being. He is the only God. What our young people have in my day, uh, I, shortly after my, my days of hearing uh, Songs and rock and roll, and when, when a rock and roll got into bad rock and roll, as far as I'm concerned, because in it was bat masking. And bat masking, uh, I, I don't know if it was Stairway to Heaven or I don't know which one it was, but if you play the song backwards, it's clear as day all the way through the song. 
Satan is God. Satan is God. Satan is God. And if I come to you and I said, Satan is God, you'd reject it immediately. You'd say, no, that's, 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 not, that's not true. I know better than that. Even if you don't know God as your Savior, you realize that is not true. But if you hear something over and over and over again, it gets into your subconscious, and whether it's played forward or backwards, and one day you'll hear Satan is God. You know Satan is God, and you're going to think, you know, yeah, I, I've, I've heard that a lot in my life. Uh, somehow or another, I think that's true. And you've fallen from the faith. So our faith has got to be built, otherwise we're going to fall for everything Satan puts out to us. Our faith is going to come under fire. It's going to be tested, and it needs to. Jesus said, when I come into this world, am I going to find faith? Which means faith is going to be tested. Faith is going to be tested, meaning that just because you gave your heart to the Lord many years ago doesn't mean you're okay now. You've got to keep a relationship. Got to keep a relationship. Just because I said, I do, 40-some years ago, doesn't mean I'm really married. I have a wife, but I don't know where in the world she might be. Well, you, you're not two as one. So with that in mind, a relationship's got to be catered to, uh, uh, nourished and exercised. First Timothy four, again, Timothy warns and says, "Hold fast to the faith, because many believers concerning the faith have s- suffered shipwreck. Many believers concerning the faith have suffered shipwreck. Our faith can mess up." The faith that I'm talking about is not speaking to the mountains again. It is a kind of faith to believe in God and know that He is your Lord, He's your Savior, and you can trust Him, have faith in Him no matter what. It's called commitment, commitment to the Lord. Peter warns about the testing too, about the last days. He said, we are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little time, if need be, you are grieved through various trials, that the genuineness of your faith is tested by fire. You ever heard of tempered steel? All right, you take, for instance, a shovel. A shovel on the end of it has got tempered steel. That means it's strong. I mean, it can, I mean, the, the handle will break before that, the shovel part will. But if somebody said, this is just steel, and it, it's not, not tempered, you'll take that shovel, and <laughs> you take a scoop of dirt, and the dirt will outdo the shovel, and the shovel will bend, and you won't have anything. That's what God wants to do with our faith. He wants to temper it so that it doesn't bend when troubles come. And I know right now we think to ourselves, well, I'm never going to just trust God. I'm never going to have that faith messed up. I'm never going to not have faith in God. I'm always going to commit myself to Him. I'm only, always going to declare Him as my Lord and Savior. I'm going to declare He is God no matter what. Yeah, well, Peter, he walked with Jesus. And Jesus even said, Peter, you're going to deny me. Not me. But you know the story. That same, basically same hour, standing before others, he said, I don't know him three times. I don't know him. I don't know him. (laughs) No, not me. So it's easy (coughs) in here, (coughs) in the safety of each other, to say, I'll never distrust God. But you let a heartache come to you. You let something very tragic take place and see where your faith is. If you're still able to say, I don't care about this furnace and I don't care about this fire, I'm going to serve God no matter what. Then you got something. Then you've got something. 
I think about Solomon. Now, I know, I know Hebrews 11 talks about all the patriarchs and how they're strong in faith. And, uh, you, you know, Joseph and Daniel and uh, Moses. And, I mean, they have a bunch of them. But there was one man that I couldn't quite understand. Solomon. Solomon was blessed with everything anybody would ever want. Solomon was blessed with a relationship with God. I mean, basically face to face with God. He was blessed with, with success in everything he did. He, God gave him wisdom, so much wisdom that kings and people from all over the world would come to hear the words of Solomon. But God gave him a solemn command. He said, look, don't intermarry with other nations. Don't do it. And what was the very thing that he was tempted by? Other women. Yeah. He didn't just intermarry with other women one time, but 700 times. Wow. Man, can you imagine remembering the names of all your wives and buying them what they wanted? Whoa, whoa. You better have everything in the world. And 300 cocky mines, and all of them foreigners. Now, why did God say don't do that? Why did God tell him don't do that? Because none of us, none of us are strong in ourselves. Because the word says, he that thinks he stands, better take heed, lest you fall. Don't think you're out there alone, Ranger. I'm telling you what, I've, I've tried riding the saddle by myself without God a couple of times. I'm going to tell you what, I'm, I know it does not work. I can't do it. I cannot do it. And neither can anybody else. And neither did Solomon. I wonder how many times the Lord spoke to him and said, Solomon, remember, I told you don't do this. You probably guessed what he said, about a thousand times. But you know how many times he heard that voice? Maybe, maybe three, five times. And after that, his conscience was seared and he was deaf to the voice of God. You can start doing something that you know is not right. God says, don't do it. And oftentimes we'll say, hmm. We'll look through the scripture to find if we got permission to do it. Y'all ever done that? Or am I the only one that did that? When I was a teenager, I'd go through the Bible and say, can I do it? Can I do it? Can I do it? Da, 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 da. Oh, God, give me a scripture. Give me permission. And God never did. But you can keep doing something long enough to finally you'll come up with a, your own man-made doctrine that makes you feel like, okay, I can do it. And it's okay with the eyes of God, too. I'm okay. Your conscience is becoming seared. And the voice of the Holy Spirit shouting to you, don't do it, don't do it. And yet we say, I don't hear a thing. And we go right ahead. And so that's why he failed a thousand times. Because he stopped listening to the voice of God. It wasn't that God wasn't talking. It's just that he wasn't listening. And you see, that's where Solomon's faith failed. And that's the kind of faith that I'm talking about. The kind of faith that says, I'm going to live for God no matter what. I'm going to live for God no matter what. In fact, I hope that would be a statement that you'd make in yourself. I'm going to live for God. This exercise, I don't often have anybody say anything. But if you will, just say that. I'm going to live for God no matter what. I'm going to live for God no matter what. Oh, you just made the devil mad. Any Christian, though, who won't forsake the besetting sins will, according to Ephesians 5, verse 16, make a doctrine out of it to say it's okay. God judged Solomon. The Bible says that he, the Lord, said to Solomon, Because you have done this, and you have not kept my commandment or my statutes, which I have commanded you, I surely will tear your kingdom away from you and give it to your servants.
it wasn't hard to keep your eyes on the Lord and keep faith in Him. If it wasn't hard to do that, then He would not have given us all the warnings about it. The Bible is filled with warnings. Watch out. Keep the faith. Watch out. Keep the faith. I think as we look at Solomon and say, well, if he didn't make it, what can I do? I don't have the wisdom that Solomon had. I don't have the, the, the relationship, uh, talking relationship like he did, hearing the voice of God, and, and I didn't have, know how the success and everything he had. If he couldn't make it, how can I? Well, look at the Apostle Paul. He was tested like no other servant in the New Testament you'll ever find. I'm not going to read all of those things to you. But he said, in all these things, I will not be moved. Remember that old song, I shall not be, I shall not be moved. Just like a tree planted by the waters, I shall not be moved. Well, I took that song to heart. I let that become a prayer. I'm not going to be moved. And Satan kept his attack up against Paul. And Paul never quit his ministry. He never stopped serving God. Paul encourages us to do the same thing. He said, endure, 2 Timothy 4, verse 5. Endure affliction. Keep reaching souls for Jesus. Fulfill your ministry. Don't let anything cause you to drift from your relationship with the Lord. I'm going to tell you what, it's not an overnight fall. Paul said, be sober and be vigilant, be watchful, for your enemy, the devil, is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And remember, he's not going to come in immediately and say, I am God. He's going to come in very subtly, very subtly. A couple, uh, I guess it was last year, I, I mentioned this illustration about this old farmer. He was feeding a mule, and that old mule was costing him a lot of money because he was eating a lot of oats, and oats weren't cheap. So he noticed the mule was eating some oats that was mixed a little bit with some sawdust, and he didn't pay attention to it. He thought, well, if the mule's not paying any attention to what he's eating, I'll start mixing a little bit of, little bit of sawdust in with his, his oats and just let him eat. And he did. And every day, that old farmer would put a little more sawdust in and a little less oats. Till finally, over a season of time, the old mule didn't eat anything this day but sawdust. And after a big belly full of sawdust, he fell over and died. A subtle movement. You mean, you mean like, a, like a frog in a frying pan, just inching the heat up a little bit, and he burns up and never even realizes it? That sawdust is like the world. Satan feeds us a little bit. I might just a little bit, just a little bit, mix it in with everything going on. Yeah, go ahead and worship the Lord. Go ahead and sing those songs of praise. Go ahead and read the Word, but here, eat this. And all of a sudden, we're eating. And, and it's not too bad. And we're getting so used to it. And finally, all we're eating is the world, the spiritual food, so to speak, of the world. And we wonder, why are we dead? Why is God displeased with me? I'm still eating. Yeah. But you're eating the dead works of the enemy. And you didn't even realize it. Happened just that fast. Just that fast. So again, the process is really subtle. And he says that in uh, Peter first, uh, 4, 4, 7, and 8, he said, uh, no, in Corinthians, I have fought a good fight. I have kept the faith. Paul said, I was tempted to eat the oats. I was tempted to give in during the trials. I was tempted to give in to sin. I was tempted to give up. 
All that sawdust was, was all around me, and I could have easily indulge it, and no one would have blamed me. But I didn't. I kept the faith and kept my eyes on the Lord no matter what. No matter what. And thus he could say this, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my race. I have kept the faith. Now there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day. But not to me only, but to all those who love his appearing. Peter said, be on guard so that you may not be carried away by the error of lawless, or law, lawless men and fall from a secure position that you have in Jesus. What do we do? We need to constantly examine ourselves. Focus on God. Read His Word. Trust and seek Him in all circumstances. If you examine your life right now, do you see any evidence of the world or the sawdust? Do you see any evidence of a slight falling from God? If you do, this is the time to shake it off and get right with God. Say, yeah, but don't I have to clean myself up first? You can't. He's the only one that does that. And thank God for his blood that covers us, cleanses us from all sin. Hallelujah.